While Boeing and Airbus battled for dominance with ever bigger jets, neither saw a $13 billion gap right beneath their wings. A gap Embraer would exploit with a jet so perfectly sized, it redefined the regional market. How did a once obscure Brazilian company outsmart the aviation giants and seize control with the E-Jet family? The answer exposes an industry blind spot and a high stakes fight few saw coming. What did Embraer see that everyone else missed? In the late 1990s, the, the world's biggest aircraft makers were locked in a race for size. Boeing and Airbus poured resources into jets that could carry 150 passengers or more, convinced that bigger planes meant bigger profits. But while the giants focused on building ever larger fleets for major hubs, a vast portion of the air travel market quietly went underserved. Hundreds of regional airports, places like Boise, Albany, and dozens of secondary cities across North America and Europe couldn't support the high passenger loads or long runways that the 737 and A320 demanded. For these airports, the only options were aging turboprops or cramped 50-seat regional jets, both of which struggled to turn a profit and left many routes abandoned. Industry analysts began to notice a pattern. Airlines wanted to serve smaller cities and thinner routes, but there simply wasn't a jet designed for that sweet spot between 70 and 150 seats. The gap was enormous, by some estimates worth between 11 and $13 billion in potential demand every year. Yet Boeing and Airbus saw this segment as a dead zone, too small to justify a new design, too big for their existing regional offerings. Their focus remained fixed on maximizing the economies of scale in larger aircraft, leaving the middle market wide open. For regional carriers, the consequences were real. Outdated fleets meant higher operating costs and limited flexibility. Airlines either flew half-empty large jets at a loss, or they pulled out of smaller markets altogether, cutting off entire communities from the air travel network. The missing aircraft wasn't just a technical oversight, it was a blind spot that shaped the economics of air travel for decades. While the giants looked up searching for the next big thing, a silent opportunity waited on the ground, measured not in prestige, but in overlooked airports and unmet demand. In 1969, in the city of São José dos Campos, a group of Brazilian engineers and policymakers set out to build something the country had never seen before, a national aircraft manufacturer. At the center stood Osiris Silva, an aeronautical engineer with a vision for Brazil's place in the skies. Embraer, short for Empresa Brasileira de Aeronáutica, was born as a government-backed project designed to foster homegrown aviation talent and reduce reliance on foreign suppliers. Early on, Embraer's ambitions were modest. The company focused on rugged, practical planes like the Bandeirante, a 15-seat turboprop first flown in 1968, and the EMB-120 Brasilia, which entered service in 1985. These aircraft became staples for regional airlines across South America, Africa, and even the United States, quietly building a reputation for reliability in tough conditions. But by the early 1990s, Embraer faced a crossroads. The global aviation market had shifted, and state-run companies struggled to keep pace with rapid innovation and international competition. In 1994, Brazil's government privatized Embraer, opening the door to outside investment and a new era of risk-taking. This move was more than a financial shakeup. It changed the company's DNA. Freed from the constraints of bureaucracy, Embraer could now chase bold ideas, attract global talent, and move at the speed of its rivals overseas. The company's new leaders understood that survival depended on more than just building planes. It meant finding a place in the world market that the giants had overlooked. Embraer's roots in regional turboprops gave it a unique perspective. The company knew how to design aircraft for challenging environments and for customers that big manufacturers ignored. This foundation, part necessity, part ingenuity, prepared Embraer to spot opportunities others missed. 
When the chance came to fill the gap between outdated regional jets and oversized mainline aircraft, Embraer was ready to act, combining technical know-how with the entrepreneurial drive unlocked by privatization. In 1999, Embraer's engineering teams gathered in São José dos Campos to tackle a question that had stumped the industry's biggest names. What would it take to build a jet that fit the needs of regional airlines, not just the ambitions of manufacturers? Their answer became the E-Jet family, four distinct aircraft, each tailored for the 70 to 146 seat range. The E-170 and E-175 targeted the lower end, while the E-190 and E-195 stretched capacity for denser routes. This wasn't a matter of shrinking a bigger jet or stretching a smaller one. Each model was purpose-built from the ground up, designed to hit the sweet spot that Boeing and Airbus had left untouched. A key design decision set the E-Jets apart, the ability to operate from runways as short as 5,000 feet. That single figure unlocked hundreds of airports that were off limits to larger jets like the 737 or A320, which typically require 7,000 feet or more. Suddenly, cities that had been sidelined by the economics of big aircraft could be reintegrated into airline networks. Embraer's engineers, led by figures like Luis Carlos Afonso, obsessed over weight, wing shape, and landing gear to ensure that even the largest E-Jet could handle short field operations without sacrificing comfort or efficiency. The launch of the E-Jet program wasn't a safe bet. Internally, debates raged over cost, risk, and whether airlines would really buy into a four-model family from a company that, just a few years earlier, had been fighting for survival. But Embraer's leadership saw the gap as an opening too good to ignore. By 2004, the first E-170s entered commercial service, and airlines quickly realized these jets weren't just filling a gap. They were redefining what a regional jet could be. The E-Jet family gave airlines the flexibility to right-size their fleets, match aircraft to route demand, and reach airports that had been written off for decades. For Embraer, it was a leap from underdog to innovator built on a foundation of technical precision and an instinct for opportunity. Every route has a number that decides its fate. For regional airlines, that number is the break-even load. How many seats must be filled for a flight to make money? With older, larger jets, airlines needed to fill 85% or more of every plane just to cover costs. That was a tall order on thin routes between smaller cities. Embraer's E-Jets changed the equation. Their e 175 m for example, can break even with just 60 to 70% of seats sold. On a typical 76-seat configuration, that's around 45 to 53 passengers. This flexibility lets airlines keep flying routes that would be unprofitable with a 737 or A320, which usually require at least 140 paying customers on the same distance. Fuel costs are another key factor. The E-175 Arntran burns about 1,100 gallons of fuel on a 500-mile trip, far less than the 1,800 gallons a 737-700 might use on the same segment. Fewer engines and lighter weight mean lower airport and navigation fees too. Crew costs drop as well. Regional jets often require just two pilots and two flight attendants, compared to the larger teams needed for bigger aircraft. All these numbers add up to a simple business case. Airlines can serve more cities more often without risking empty seats or red ink. For finance teams, the e-jet's math is hard to ignore. It turns marginal routes into steady earners, and it does so with predictable, manageable costs that giants like Boeing and Airbus couldn't match in this segment. Step onto an Embraer E-Jet, and the difference is immediate. Instead of the narrow, cramped cabins that defined older regional jets, passengers find a space designed for comfort on short-haul flights. The 2-2 seating means no one ever gets stuck in a middle seat, a small mercy that travelers remember. 
Each window is noticeably larger than on a Bombardier CRJ, letting in more daylight and offering a better view of the world below. Overhead bins are generous, fitting standard carry-ons without the usual struggle or gate check routine. Noise is kept to a gentle hum thanks to careful insulation and engine placement. Compared to the whine and vibration of the previous generation, the E-Jet's cabin feels calm, more like a mainline jet than a regional workhorse. Airlines noticed the effect in their own customer surveys. Flyers consistently rated the E-175 and E-190 above competitors for comfort, even on short flights. For frequent travelers, these details add up. The absence of a middle seat, the space for a bag, a quieter ride. Each one turns an ordinary hop into something closer to a mainline experience. Carriers quickly realized that a better cabin wasn't just a perk, it became part of their brand. When a passenger's first impression is shaped by comfort and ease, loyalty follows. In a market where airlines compete for every repeat customer, Embraer's focus on the human side of flying wasn't just smart engineering. It gave regional airlines a secret weapon, turning overlooked routes into places where passengers actually wanted to return. Inside Embraer's São José dos Campos facility, the math behind every jet is different from what drives the giants. Brazilian labor costs run a fraction of those in the US or Western Europe, giving Embraer a built-in price advantage before a single part is assembled. The company controls much of its supply chain locally, shielding itself from wild currency swings and volatile global markets that can send costs soaring for rivals. This efficiency isn't just about cheap labor, it's about flexibility. When a supplier in Europe faces a strike or a currency shock, Embraer can keep lines moving with alternate sources or in-house solutions, a lesson learned from decades of economic turbulence in Brazil. For airlines, reliability is everything. The E-Jet family quickly built a reputation for showing up on time, day after day, in environments that punish lesser designs, humid Amazon runways, freezing Canadian winters, high-altitude airports in Mexico. Dispatch reliability rates hover above 99%. Maintenance chiefs from SkyWest to Azul point to the global network of Embraer support centers, with parts warehouses and technical staff on call from Miami to Munich. If a jet goes down, help is rarely more than a phone call and a short flight away. That level of support builds trust, and trust turns into repeat orders. These advantages create a kind of stickiness. Once an airline invests in e-jets, retraining crews and mechanics, stocking spare parts, and building schedules around their performance, switching to another manufacturer becomes a costly gamble. Embraer's cost edge and reliability don't just win sales, they keep airlines loyal, even as competitors scramble to catch up. The regional jet market, once ignored by the giants, soon became a battleground. In 2017, Boeing filed a trade complaint with the U.S. government, accusing Bombardier of selling its new C-Series jets below cost thanks to Canadian subsidies. The Commerce Department responded with proposed tariffs approaching 300%, a move so aggressive it stunned the industry. But instead of protecting Boeing's turf, the gambit backfired. In January 2018, the U.S. International Trade Commission ruled that Bombardier's sales hadn't harmed American manufacturers. The tariffs vanished overnight. The real shock came just months later. Airbus swooped in and acquired a majority stake in the C-Series program for little more than a symbolic payment. With a single deal in July 2018, Airbus gained a modern, fuel-efficient jet and an instant foothold in the 100 to 150 seat category. Territory both giants had once dismissed. Production ramped up, including a new assembly line in Alabama, sidestepping any future trade barriers. Not to be outmaneuvered, Boeing pursued its own counter-strike. In July 2018, it announced plans to buy 80% of Embraer's commercial jet division for $4.2 billion. The deal dragged on through regulatory reviews and mounting financial strain, 
especially after the 737 MAX crisis and the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. In April 2020, Boeing abruptly walked away, leaving Embraer independent and the regional jet landscape more fractured than ever. Pilot union contracts in the United States draw a hard line at 76 seats and 86,000 pounds. These limits, known as scope clauses, were meant to protect mainline pilots' jobs by capping the size and weight of jets regional affiliates could fly. For most manufacturers, these rules became a brick wall. The Boeing 737 and Airbus A220 both tipped the scales above the threshold, locking them out of the regional market. But Embraer's E-175 was engineered with laser precision. 76 seats, 85,517 pounds maximum takeoff weight, not a single seat or pound to spare. That exact fit isn't a coincidence, it's a fortress. The result is a regulatory moat that competitors can't cross. Airlines in the U.S. have no real alternative for new jets in this category. The E-175 fills more than 70% of all U.S. regional jet flights with some carriers operating fleets made up entirely of Embraer aircraft. Attempts to sneak larger planes into the segment have failed, and even Embraer's own next-generation E-175E2 can't get under the weight limit. The fortress holds. As long as the scope clause stands, Embraer's lead is untenable, a rare case where a contract, not just a product, decides who wins the market. Success in aviation is never permanent. Embraer's dominance in the regional jet market rests on foundations that can shift overnight. The story of the Boeing 717 stands as a warning. Originally launched as the MD-95, the 717 was Boeing's attempt to capture the small jet segment. But the design, inherited from an earlier era, proved too heavy and too costly to operate. Airlines favored newer, more efficient jets. By May 2006, Boeing delivered its last 717, ending production after just 156 aircraft. The Giants had missed the mark, but the lesson lingered. Even entrenched players can lose their footing when the market moves on. Embraer's own future is tied to the same kind of uncertainty. The E-175E2 designed to bring next-generation efficiency to regional flying, remains grounded, not for lack of technology, but because it can't squeeze under the 86,000-pound weight limit set by U.S. pilot contracts. The program was officially suspended in 2022. As long as scope clauses hold, Embraer's older E-175 stays in demand. But if those rules change, the company's regulatory moat could vanish in a single round of labor negotiations. For Embraer's strategists, the path ahead is defined less by engineering and more by the unpredictable tides of regulation and airline economics. The question isn't just whether Embraer can hold its lead, but whether the ground beneath its feet will stay solid at all. At by 2023, Embraer held over 70% of the U.S. regional jet market, a position built on the precise fit of the E-175 within the 76-seat scope clause, a rule documented in every major pilot contract since the early 2000s. This documentary showed how, while Boeing and Airbus chased larger jets, Embraer targeted a neglected $11 billion segment and designed aircraft that regional airlines could actually use and profit from. The failed Boeing 717, Airbus's late A220 entry, and the collapse of Boeing's $4.2 billion joint venture with Embraer are all on public record. Yet the future remains uncertain. Pilot union negotiations and the paused E-175 E2 program leave open questions about how long Embraer's dominance will last. But as of today, Airline filings and fleet data confirm Embraer's strategy outmaneuvered the giants, turning a market gap into a global stronghold. The story of Embraer's tiny jet is proof that in aviation, the right size at the right time can change an entire industry.